This is the web transmission service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On the morning of November the 2nd, the RCMI hosted a ceremony in which a ceremonial pipe was repatriated to the White Cap Dakota Nation, having been absent from its ancestral home for 138 years and in the holdings of the RCMI Museum since 1909. I'm Michael Clary. I'm the President and Executive Director of the Institute and a host for this very important event. I want to begin by acknowledging that the land that we're meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Thank you for joining us on this land. I want to particularly welcome our guests, Mr. Fraser Tolmey, Member of Parliament for the Riding of Moose Jaw, Lake Centre, Lanigan, Mr. Kevin Wong, Member of Parliament for Spadina, Fort York. Councillor Frank Royal of the White Cap Dakota Nation. Mr. Murray Long, Director, Self-Government, White Cap Dakota Nation. And Mr. Sheldon Buffalo, Cultural Liaison for the White Cap Dakota Nation. I now invite Ryan Goldsworthy to speak. He is our Museum Director and Curator. Ryan. Thank you, Mike, and I'd like to echo the President's sentiments just to welcome you all to this proceeding, this very important event this morning. I'd also like to recognize our members of Parliament uh, for taking some time out of their busy schedules to be here, and it really makes a difference, so thank you. My name is Ryan Goldsworthy. As Mike said, I'm the Museum Director and the Curator of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. The RCMI itself, and I welcome you all to it today, is one of the largest and oldest military history museums in Canada. We were founded in 1890, which does connect to this object that will tell just a little bit about its journey uh, over the next 10 minutes. As well, I'd like to add, at the end of our important ceremony this morning, I will be offering a curatorial tour uh, of the museum itself, if you'd like to join me on that. Before I move on, I'd also like to recognize our honored guests from the White Cap Dakota Nation, Councillor Frank Royal, Mr. Sheldon Buffalo, and Mr. Murray Long. Thank you for your support and having this happen today. So this project began for myself and for the RCMI just over two years ago, when I was contacted in August of 2021 by the Museum Register of the City of Toronto, Gabrielle Major. They had discovered in the city's collection an indigenous ceremonial pipe with unknown provenance. The only clue which had led back to the RCMI was an old accession number stenciled and lacquered on the underside of the object, which is still visible today. Here was an incredible 138-year mystery to be resolved. So I took that small bit of information. I reviewed all the RCMI's museum records dating back to 1894, when the Institute first began collecting objects. In my search, I was able to match the pipe in the city's collection to a donation made in 1909, if you can believe it by a Lieutenant Colonel William H. Merritt. Though Merritt died in 1918, right after the First World War, his purposeful action of donating the pipe to the RCMI Museum helped to ensure its preservation and its ultimate survival. In reviewing the histories and in the archives as I continued, I came to learn that Merritt 
had been a lieutenant with the Governor General's Bodyguard for Ontario, which was a Toronto Cavalry Regiment, by the way, during the Northwest Resistance of 1885. It was during the resistance in May of 1885 near Batoche, Saskatchewan, to be exact, where Merritt was instructed to capture Chief Whitecap, his family, and other Dakota people who had left the area following the Battle of Fish Creek. Merritt's detachment ultimately pursued and accepted the surrender of Chief, Chief Whitecap. We found the following passage in the Governor General's Bodyguard Regimental History, which was written in 1902, which details the time shortly after the surrender. I'll just read this very short passage. Next morning, May 19, 1885, White Cap and his chief braves solemnly smoked the pipe of peace with Merritt and Fleming and presented the pipe to the former. The pipe is made of Minnesota soapstone with a decorated wooden mouthpiece some 18 inches long. And there it is in living color. It's amazing. As part of Dakota cultural and spiritual traditions, the pipe is smoked with due ceremony to seal friendships and signify agreements. I knew then what we had discovered was a sacred cultural object of great importance, a piece of history which had physically belonged to the chief which gave his namesake to the nation. From our museum perspective, if I might add, the 120-year-old accession number on the underside of the pipe is a lesson to the importance of diligent collections management, a fact that I can now impart on my staff and students who are here. <laughs> it's a testament to the work that we are doing now and for future generations who will know what we have put on similar objects. So over the next year and a half, um, alongside Cheryl Blackman, Gabrielle, Richard Gerard, Susan Brown, Alex Adichuk and Kathy Malloy, some of which are sitting in the front row here. I worked as a part of the City of Toronto's Groundbreaking Reconciliation and Repatriation Committee. We together discussed and devised the work required in repatriating a sacred object in the right way. In the right way is what we focused this whole time and it's what's brought us here today. The City of Toronto had not yet repatriated an object back to community of origin, and neither had the RCMI. A couple more things. On March 10th of this year, we participated in a private ceremony at the City of Toronto's Collections and Conservation Centre in Liberty Village, which was presided over by the Medeawan Society. These members of the Society who are of the Ashinaabe people, conducted this beautiful and moving ceremony in transferring the pipe back to our CMI. The conviction of responsibility which was communicated to me through the members of the society was another compelling force to see this repatriation fully realized. It's something I'll never forget for those that were there as well. It was also at this ceremony that the society communicated that the pipe was an animate object, an animate object, and that they had identified the pipe as female with a distinguishable face. I was asked by them to communicate these details to the people of the White Cap Dakota Nation. In June, this is the last part of the story, which brings us up to today. Following valuable consultation with fellow curator, Dr. Justin Jennings of the Rom, I made direct contact with Murray Long and with Councillor Frank Royal. We had a private viewing of the pipe at RCMI that same month, and it was especially impactful to see Councillor Royal's reaction to seeing the pipe for the first time. 
I could say as well, and I don't mean to be flippant, but that same month, Zach Whitecloud of the Dakota people also won his first Stanley Cup, which I think was surely another good omen. <laughs> so through the tireless efforts that followed, and in the spirit of friendship and re reconciliation, members of both the RCMI and the White Cap Dakota Nation have collaborated to bring together this ceremony of repatriation. The RCMI is proud to return this sacred object to its rightful home. Though we cannot know the spirit in which the pipe was acquired or received, by merit from Chief White Cap all those years ago, or of the almost certain cultural mis misunderstanding between these two men, we can say that returning the pipe to the Dakota people is the right thing to do. We hope that efforts such as this will help to reinforce reconciliation and mutual respect between indigenous and non-indigenous communities. This is my last word. It has been a privilege to work with this indelible and sacred piece of history and with the White Cap Dakota Nation for its repatriation. We recognize the importance of this initiative to Canadian history and to the Dakota people. Thank you. It's now time to transfer the pipe. We recognize that this bundle has been away from its home for 138 years, and we are honored to return it to its people where it belongs. We accept this gift on behalf of White Cap. Very thankful to RCMI, North York, for taking care of this beautiful piece. Thank you very much.
also want to acknowledge uh, Justin Jennings from the Royal Ontario Museum, who we met uh, a year ago uh, to just visit, uh, looking at some artifacts there at the time. Also want to acknowledge Cheryl Blackman and Kathy Malloy, City of Toronto. Special thanks to Ryan Goldsworthy, museum creator at University of Maya, who brought us all together here today. His efforts to reach us, reach out to us, will not be forgotten. We look forward to our community next week when the, preside, when the pipe is presented to our people. A little bit of history on White Cap. He uh, settled his, uh, the nation south of Saskatoon in the 1860s in their traditional hunting and uh, trading territory. The reserve was established in 1882, and Chief White Cap was recognized as one of the founding fathers of Saskatoon, a partnership that goes back over 130 years. We now have uh, on the, in the community a casino, hotel, golf course, and uh, with more projects planned. And we're also recognized as a regional employer in the area. Today marks day 63 of uh, our self-governing First Nation through a governor's treaty recently reached with the government of Canada. In 1885, the real resistance and Chief White Cap's role, he, uh, he also helped ensure Saskatoon was not attacked with his partnership with the city here. His group traveled to Batash where he encouraged a peaceful resolution. Captured by Lieutenant Merritt, uh, taken to Batash and then held in detention in Regina. And this picture here, I believe, it was taken uh, just outside Humble, Saskatchewan. Uh, and he was also released on his partnerships with, uh, with uh, Saskatoon and its citizens. Chief White Cap had earned the right to be a pet carrier. And Been 138 years since the pipe heard that we're liked. 1889, White Cat passed away. Government of Canada's policy under, under the Indian Act was to remove all the cultural properties from Indians. We believe that under those orders, Chief White Cat's pipe was taken from that. I would like to believe that Lieutenant Merritt recognized the importance of the pipe and took good care of it. Um, Perhaps without Lieutenant Merritt and his actions, this pipe would never have returned to its rightful owners. Many of these types of projects are lost in their communities forever. So on behalf of Chief Darcy Bear, Councillor Dwayne Eagle, our elders, and all the White Cap Dakota people, we are truly grateful to RCMI that this pipe is returning to our community. This act for reconciliation is that much more timely as, as it coincides with our treaty, governance treaty with Canada. Our treaty connects a long-standing mistreatment of the Dakotas who are allies with the British Crown, with the, such as the War of 1812 and uh, promises that were made to Dakota. The, the Dakotas are now recognized as Aboriginal peoples of Canada under the Constitution of Canada. Bringing home this pipe helps to cement our new place in Canada. In honor of Pete Gidamia, thank you, thank you all for this. Thank you very much, Council. That concludes our ceremony. It's, there's now an opportunity for the media to conduct any interviews they wish to do. And then there will be a tour of the Institute for our guests. And we're also happy to uh, provide tours for anybody who's here. Thank you all for attending to witness the return of this ceremonial pipe to its people. Thank you.